All right, welcome everyone to the last Geo Talk of the, of the first quarter. And this evening, the Geo Talk is going to be given by Maximilian Hash, who is a PhD student here in the school. Uh, but tonight, he's not speaking about his PhD studies. He'll be speaking about his MSc studies, which he completed at Berlin University under one of our former staff members, Uwe Reimholt, uh, who now works there. And the subject of his talk this evening is going to be on that research. He hails from Germany, but lived in Italy for a large part of his life, um, but did his undergrad and MSc uh, research in, in Germany. So Max, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome everyone. And today I want to take you to a very nice location in Finland, where I did the data taking for my MSc under Uwe Reimert and with great help of Uli Raschke and Patrice Zag. I also worked at the Museum for Naturkunde and took it as a chance to organize a field trip in Finland. Now, here's our team. I will quickly go over shutter counts and why I did this study. And of course, introduce the impact structure, the Kyoto Selke, one of many fun names that we have there for the locations. Uh, of course, I will talk about why we were there, the methods and our goals, and stress the results. We were looking at joints in the impact structure to find uh, the impact of the meteorite on the local geology, look at shutter cones at the orientation, and try to find a possible relation between them and jointing. Also, some samples were taken. I will be going over the micropetography that we did. And of course, discuss all the results. Now, shutter cones are these conical features with striations on them. And they are the only distinct macroscopic impact criterion. Or other criteria are either not distinct, for example, the crater shape isn't really a conclusive criterion, or they are not microscopic, so you will first have to take samples. Shutter cones, however, are allowed to conf confidently confirm an impact structure while in the field without first having to make lab analysis. That is why they are uh, well studied. And there are still a few open questions about their formation. But the general process is that you have a heterogeneity in the bedrock, here shown with our black dot. And once the meteorite arrives and hits the ground, it will send a shock wave, which interacts with that heterogeneity and forms a shatter cone. Now, precisely as I said, there are still a few different theories about the particulars of the formation, but the leading theory is that the main shock wave here in red, when interacting with the heterogeneity, forms a scattered wave, which then in turn interacts again with the main shock wave. Now there is an overlay in front of that heterogeneity. It will attenuate the shock wave but behind it, it will sum with it and therefore increase the shock pressure to create conical fractures. So from that theory, it is to expect that the apex of each structure is oriented towards where the main shock wave came from, so towards the center of the impact structure. However, studies by Nikolaisen and Reimold at the Redefort Dome have shown that there is a heterogeneous distribution of shatter counts so that they are not all oriented in the same direction. We will also check the orientation of shatter counts here at Kyoto Seika, of course. Speaking of which, this is our structure. It is situated in the southern part of Finland and is in a glacial landscape. There is a very beautiful glacial lake here. And the structure is already, is actually not a crater, it has been eroded. 
and the only reason it was determined was on the finding of indeed shutter cones. Now the geology of this is mostly granitic gneisses and amphibolites, which are part of the central Finland granitoid complex. That one formed about 1.88 billion years ago during the deformative part of the Swicofenian orogenesis. There are three regional fault orientations discovered by Nironen. These regional joints strike northeast southwest, one strikes northwest southeast, and one strikes north south. So when we analyze the joints in our impact structure, we have to keep that in mind, that these are already there. The structure itself was discovered by Hertala and Moilanen in 2004, as I said, on the basis of shutter cone findings, and delimited by them in 2007. From their publication in 2007 is this map, where the red triangles are in situ shutter cone findings with arrows for the mean orientation that they found at these locations for shutter counts. And this minimal structural extent, delimited in red here, is basically the extent of the area of shutter count findings. The impact character of the structure was confirmed by Ferrier et al. in 2010, as they found planar deformation features in rocks sampled there. Seen in a picture here, these planar deformation features are, well, as the name already says, deformative planes, which appear oriented at major crystallographic lattice orientations. The impact structure was also dated by Schmieder et al. through argon argon dating on a pseudo tachylytic fracture that they found in the structure. And the age was determined to be about 1.14, 1.15 billion years. Now, we spent 14 days at Kyoto Selka, and we wanted to investigate, of course, the influence of the impact on local geology. For that, we measured both the spacing and orientation of local joints. We also measured the orientation of shutter cones to determine a possible relation to jointing of them. And we took samples to analyze them for planar deformation features and find a possible relation to the impact and to the place of the impact from them. Let's dive right into the results. Now, the joint spacing as seen here already has a difference close to the crater center and far from it. The joints are closer spaced within the structure, close to the center, which led us to make three categories for joint spacing, which were then mapped, as can be seen here. The yellow circuits correspond to joint spacing between a few centimeters and a few decimeters. The green pentagons correspond to joint spacing between a few decimeters and a few meters, and the blue squares are joint spacing that are more than a meter. Now, you already noticed that the closed space joints are all inside the, the impact structure, while most of the far space joints are outside of it. Unfortunately, we don't have enough data to the south and west, the reason for that is that our base was right here at that dot. And each day we would take our car around the lake and back in the evening. And we simply couldn't get all this way in one day. You can kind of see the farthest that we could get north and south. It was also not possible to put the car on a boat and go across the lake. We had a small boat which we used to visit these islands. Three of us were fitting in the boat. It was probably only made for two people. And the day what we went, we almost ran on a cliff, so we decided to never ever do that again. 
but from the data that we did recover, we can see that this closed spacing is offset a little bit to the west. So this could mean one of two things. Either the impact happened more to the west than previously assumed, or it was an oblique impact that sent more pressure and more fracturing to the west than to the east. Uh, so which of those is it? This is unfortunately not determinable by the joint spacing alone. We had to make more measurements on this. But let's keep with joints first, as we also measured the joint orientation at these locations. And they were measured with a geological compass and then plotted on a Schmidt net. I assume everyone is familiar with a Schmidt net here. So of course, joint planes, they give circle segments and plotting all of the joints inside the structure on one Schmidt net and all outside on another Schmidt net, we have this. And as you can very clearly see, there isn't really much to see in the way of trends, so what is there to do? The first thing I did, I took pole points to our joint trends. So pole points will plot as dots on the Schmidt net, each dot being 90 degrees from the plane. Here we can already see some clusters of joint trends, which I then quantified by making a contour map. Now this really shows some trends outside and inside the structure. Outside there are four trends that we can see. Trend A, delimited by these two clouds here. Again, 90 degrees, so these here correspond to very steeply dipping joints. Trend B is also delimited over here and also by shallower joints. Trend C has, a slim, has the uh, joint trends and we have a cluster of very shallow dipping joints making up trend D. Now by comparison inside the crater there is a huge maximum on trend B which kind of overprints the other ones, but you can see there is a really large cloud. If there was less data for trend B, you would have separate clouds here for trend A, as you have on that side, also for trend C. A little bit for trend, hold on, trend A, trend, yes, a little bit for trend C, sorry. And again, shallow joints for trend D. Now the first thing to be said is that three of those four trends correspond to the regional trends that I had introduced, which were measured by Nirone, namely trend A, B, and D. And also the other, the trend C, can be seen both inside and outside the crater. So the joint orientation is not really influenced by the impact. That means the impact influenced the joint spacing, but not its orientation. Why did it do that? My theory is that there were already pre-existing weak zones from the Swakophanian orogenesis. And what the impact did was reactivate those weak zones and create joints along them without influencing their orientation. Now that we have that, let's see how the shutter counts relate. We already have some pictures here. Are they all oriented towards the center? Well, you can already see in the left-hand picture that there is a heterogeneous distribution. There are some shutter cones <coughs> oriented to the right side of the picture, and some are oriented to the top. So whichever direction the center is, not all shutter cones are oriented towards it. So where are they oriented to? Well, we have a really nice joint over here and another one up here, which some of the shutter cones are oriented towards each. Also something to note is the shutter cone shape. It is not really round, instead it is polygonal, being almost composed of small fractures. Something like this was already noticed in the Riddeford impact structure, also by Nikolai Snandreimold, 
and was termed multiply striated joint structures. Now we also want to have quantitative on top of this qualitative data, of course. So first off, let's look at the shutter cone distribution shown here. The arrows showing more or less the mean orientation of shutter cones. You already see they are kind of all over the place. But the shutter cone occurrence seems to kind of be stay within the crater except for this one down here. There was one finding of a possible shutter cone seen here. There are a few striations at this outcrop, striations being over here. However, these striations are not very well developed. So with that, it could not be determined with confidence whether these are shutter cone striations or something else. They, are, they may be slick and slice instead. So since this was the only finding of any type of striations outside the structure, we can say that our findings uh, do confirm the size of the impact structure, as said previously by Hetterle and Moylan. About the orientation, shutter cone clusters were seen in these locations. We didn't make extensive measurements on this island for the reason I already mentioned. And over here at Hirinsari and Simulanti, there were several shutter cones, but not really extensive clusters. We had very nice clusters of shutter cones here in the center at Yehaniemi and Samakoniemi, where measurements were taken. So we delimited about seven areas like this. It's an example. Each area being about one square meter in size. And inside that area, all of the joints and all of the shutter cones were measured. The joints here in blue were measured as planes with a geological compass, and shutter cones shown with yellow had their striations measured, several striations for each shutter cone, which were then, from these striations, then their apex orientation was calculated on the Schmidt net. Then for each of the total of seven areas, of those two outcrops, a Schmidt net was made with circle segments for joints and dots for shutter counts. We can already see sort of a correlation, but plotting all of them on the same Schmidt net, I put some areas for the general joint trends, which it's no surprise at this point correspond to the joint trends that we have observed inside the impact crater. We have our trend A, B, and C, and as I said, again, our very shallowly dipping trend D. And the really interesting part is that not only do almost all of the shutter cone apices plot within these um, joint trends, where well, except for this one, this is sort of the rebel, they also mostly plot where two or more joint trends intersect, for example here at an intersection between trend B and D. That means that most of the apices are not only oriented towards one joint, but towards an intersection of more than one joint. So what we, let us make a short discussion. The joints do not only influence the orientation of the shutter cones, but also their shape as we can see here, a polygonal shape. And apparently these well, fractures are part of the fall into the joint trends as the orientation of the shutter cone apex goes at two intersection of several <coughs> joint trends. Now let's talk about petrography. We took samples from all of these locations here and checked them for planar deformation features. We only found planar deformation features in samples from this centralmost location at Yehaniami. The study by Ferrier et al. made before us also found planar deformation features here and at the another outcrop to the south at Vaikia near me, 
from which we, however, did not take any samples. Now, the samples that we took were cut in our thin section preparation lab along three planes. These three planes were chosen with respect to our shutter cone surface. Here is our shutter cone, and one of them, XY plane, was parallel, and two of them were perpendicular to the surface. And on the perpendicular cut thin sections, we made sure that the surface itself is on the thin section. This one here is perpendicular to it, and you can really nicely see the striations on it. Our planar deformation features were found. An example of it is here. We found uh, either one planar set of planar deformation features per grain, or two of them, never more than two. These features were then measured using a universal stage, which is this kind of science fiction looking thing over here. And what it does is it allows you to tilt your thin section and therefore get a three-dimensional view of the features that you have in there. With that, it is possible to determine the orientation of your planar deformation features and put it in correspondence to major lattice orientations. These lattice orientations here are 1, 0, minus 1, 3 and 1, 0, minus 1, 4 can give insight into the shock pressure that acted on the sample. Now to index those planes, indexing per hand is pretty tedious. So I use two automated programs. I use two just to make sure that there is not some uh, error in one of the algorithms. And as the two give the same results, I'm pretty confident that this is the actual indexing result. We have two trends, one on the 1, 0, minus 1, 3 orientation, and one of the 1, 0, minus 1, 4 orientation, which is auxiliary to the 1, 0, minus 1, 3. These are confirm the findings that were previously made by Ferrier et al. They also have a maximum on 1, 0, minus 1, 4 and 1, 0, minus 1, 3. And from that, they determined a shock pressure of between 12 and 20 gigapascal for that area, which we could confirm in our study. While looking at our thin sections, however, we also found something else. We found fractures that had an interesting fracture fill. Some of these fractures would stay at the surface and curve around. Some would pervade the whole sample. And we also had a material, maybe a melt, that was coating our shutter cone surfaces. That led us to make some electron microprobe analysis on both the coating seen here, two sections across it with point measurements, and also of the fracture fill. Here is a nicely filled fracture. Uh, what we kind of hoped to measure was the same composition, which would might indicate an impact mate, which coated the samples and also pervaded it within these fractures. But in case that it were, the mate would be heterogeneous, we also made measurements on the minerals close to the veins so that it could, would have been possible in that case to correlate the mate to the mineralogy and chemistry of the minerals around it. So if you are also hoping that the melt indicates a, an impact melt, I have some good and bad news for you. The measurements showed that the composition of the surface coating and of the vein fill is the same, the same chemistry. The bad news is that that chemistry is from alteration material. So whatever our vein fill and coating was has been extensively altered in that long time that our samples were sitting there throughout, well, the last thing that happened was the last ice age running over it. And 
during these over one billion years, hydrothermal alteration happened and extensively altered them to the point that the original fill cannot be determined anymore. At least it couldn't be determined in this study, but in case anyone likes to make a project about it, all the samples are still there, the thin sections are still there, you might get in contact and go for it. So let's wrap up our findings. In conclusion, we found that the impact at Kyoto Seika reactivated previous fault systems. Based on shutter cone findings, the likely size of the structure was also confirmed. Shutter cones show relation to local jointing, both in their orientation and in their shape. This leads me to believe that well, they are obviously not oriented in the direction of the main shockwave, but why not? So the bedrock at Kyoto Seika was already very much fractured before the impact happened. This gave a lot of planar shaped heterogeneities that had a lot of scattering of the primary shock wave. So what I think happened was that a lot of the scatter wave, scattered waves overlapped and created shutter cones. So the shutter cones formed in relation not to the main shock wave and scattering, but in relation to several scattered waves, which is why they are oriented towards the joints. Now, the planar deformation features were found only in the central part of the previously determined area of the impact, which uh, confirmed the location of the impact. So I had made this question earlier from the findings of joint spacing. Did the impact happen more to the west or was it oblique? Thanks to the findings of shutter cone, their distribution, and the planar deformation feature finding. We could determine that indeed it impacted at the center. It did not impact further to the west. So it was probably an oblique impact, which is why the joint spacing is offset to the west. With that, I thank you for your attention. I will, of course, take questions. But if you like to read any further, a paper came out of this project which was published in the Journal of the Meteoritic and Planetary Science in August 2016. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Any questions? Please speak loudly for you. Starting with Roger. Hi, Max. Um, my question, I guess, is that did you plot up individual shadow cones and show that the linear striations were actually converging. Uh, the, the, the problem with the MSJS model is that yes, any two planes will intersect in a line, but they'll, they'll, you'll then get one line of intersection. You won't get a spray of, 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 of radiating lines, which is what is the definition of a, of a shadow cone. So how do you, as a structural geologist, how do you reconcile uh, your data with that model that these, these things should point back to a center, not just be delineations on inclined, vertically inclined planes. Sure, if I understand you correctly, the problem is that if you plot single striations, they will of course be oriented to the wall, towards the joint that they are on. Joint intersection, yeah. So, so yes, it's, so you're saying it's two joints intersecting. So what I did was to first leave out all the joints and just intersect the striations that I have measured for each of the shutter cones to find one point where they all converge, which would then be the apex orientation. So those and are the only dots. once I had that apex orientation, I plotted it related to the joints. This idea that uh, the, the direction of the shadow cone uh, apexes uh, emanates from the site of impact which I think you're trying to prove wrong here, isn't it? Right? Am I right? Yeah. Because I, I'm wondering, where does this idea come from? Ha, has there been any um, yes. documentation in an in a impact structure where this does seem to work? There is the type locality where it comes from is from the Ries crater in Germany. So for a long time, that was the most studied crater because 
of how well it was still preserved. And what I think why all the shutter counts are oriented towards the center, the center there is that the impact happened in calcitic rock, so in sediment. In what? Calcitic Cal sediment. Cal 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 Calcareous rocks. Yes, calcareous. So you did not really have any fractures or joints in there that would make the heterogeneities. Most of the heterogeneities you had in there were maybe, for example, fossils or some batches of different uh, lithology. So you had point shaped heterogeneities, which means that you had a, well, basically the model that I had shown in the beginning, where you have a point source from which the scattered web emanates, and only behind that point source, you will have a shutter cone developed. So how old was that Reese Trader? How old was it? It's pretty young. I don't really know the age from the top of my head. Neither do I. Well, if it's young, yeah. then your work suffers from the fact that this is not young. That so is true. You, you, know, you have a billion years of subsequent geologic history to who knows to do who knows what to fall to fault in and have glaciers creating joints and fractures. And, you know, sure, but you I, I, if I was going to prove, try to prove that theory wrong, I would, I would try to do it in a young, a youngish way. To I see. What you do have already, uh, although, is you have shutter cones very close to one another, striations even touching one another, which are <coughs> obviously in the same rock. There could not have been any deformation in between those shutter points that displaced them that are oriented in different directions. Yeah. I maybe should have put that photo here, but there's actually one example where you have two shutter cones going in opposite directions with their bases touching. Okay. Sam. Okay, I've got a comment and a question. The comment is following on this discussion. Actually, one of the classic studies on shutter cone orientation was done by, by Bob Hargraves and by Bob, Bob Dietz on the Freeport structure yeah. back in the early 60s. Yeah. And Roger Hart told me about that. <laughs> okay, so and, and that, in that case, you sort of, you know, uh, sort of unfolded the orbital bit, and then the shadow cones all seem to point upwards. Is that wrong? Uh, <coughs> he says this is wrong. Yeah. So that was the, that was the one of the <laughs> original studies that kind of. It's a very cool story. Okay. But he always ruins the Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my, my question concerns uh, 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 two things. One is what is the actual uh, inferred size of the, of the crater? And, and secondly, I'm a bit confused about uh, the spacing of your joints. If you're saying that the joints are pre uh, impact, they are yeah. related to regional tectonics and there were three sets of joints which were pre existing. Yes. Then and then the, the, the impact occurred so that the shadow cones are nucleated on the joint surfaces. But my question is, you've got spacing of the joints inside the structure uh, different from the from spacing outside. It. How does that? How does that explain joints with pre-existing? Well, uh, let me answer the latter question first. Of course, there are was reactivation of weak zones, which. Uh, created further joints, but that does not mean that all the joints inside the impact structure were created by the impact. So there were definitely pre existing joints there to oriented towards which the shutter cones could form. Also, there is a question <laughs> about what forms at what stage in the impact. However, it has been quite a while from the study. I don't really want to make a statement on that one right now. But there, the, my point is there definitely were pre-existing joints there. There were just around as many as we see now. And the first question could so you... The size of the crater, the original. Yes, yeah, that is an interesting thing. Now the crater, of course, has been eroded. We have our shutter cones. And shutter cones usually form in the central part of the crater. So whenever there was this uh, outline there, it has an about, I think, 12 to 15 kilometer diameter. 
What? That was the diameter of the of your red circle. The red circle. It's about twelve kilometers. Twelve. Uh, uh, the, the, the radius was twelve. Twenty-five, wasn't it? I should have to check again. Uh, the general yeah. scale was ten to ten. So ten. And radius and diameter okay. are related by a factor of two. Yes. The sure. Then the diameter was twenty. But that only shows the minimum size of the impact structure. Uh, stratocones usually happen in the central part of the crater. So there is sort of a calculation that is done on fresh craters with the uh, size being calculated from the area of stratocone distribution. But here we are in the bedrock under the crater. So that calculation doesn't apply anymore because the area of stratocone is more extensive here. So the crater is inevitably larger than the area of shutter cone, but it's hard to determine the exact size of it. Last question from Carl, and Roger, you can have a question for the team. Why, if, <coughs> excuse me, why if you can see shutter cones on the surface, can't you see the actual outline of the crater on, on, a, on a sort of a regional scale? Uh, that is, because there are some shutter cones, of course, that form on the surface, and a lot of them form in the bedrock. So the area of shutter cone goes really deep into the rock beneath the crater. And all of the cratered material was eroded over time. And what we see now is the area beneath the crater with the deepest sitting shutter cones exposed at the surface. Okay, we'll get right to the last question. Thank you so much time. Um, to just, just a question then. Firstly, for the crater that's in excess of 25 kilometers diameter, yes. there must have been significant rotational disturbance in the central parts, which is where you've got the best outcomes. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. if your jointing is roughly vertical, it might not make too much of a difference, but you could have seen distortion of the regional trends. And I don't know if you, you look for that statistically to say this is, this is impact-related rotation as the central peak comes up. But the, the, the question I wanted to ask was, um, you had two areas, two, two localities that were fairly close together. Did you, did you see anything that allowed you to say, we think the center of the structure is here and we're on a radial trend of say, zero to zero, and the, the, the cone axes cluster around zero to zero. In other words, that you were seeing a radial uh, differentiation, or the circumferential differentiation of the trends. Did you did you try that? Wasn't there enough variation in the in the radial orientation of the outcrops to actually allow that? So if I understand you correctly, you would like to know if I did sort of a correlation between the location uh, of the area within the crater and the orientation of joints and shutter cones. Relative to the center where you think Relative the center of the structure is. Does it does it vary? I, as far as I saw as I remember, uh, it doesn't really vary. I have shown this one image of the mean orientations of our shutter cones, where I had already been saying they are all over the place. So the central part would be sort of here, sort of this, and we already have two conflicting orientations on these two outcomes. Well, when, when you have the same trend, you actually have radial trends there in the northeast, and in the, in the east you have essentially also radial trends. The cones may point in different directions. It's only the ones just below that that look like they are tangential. So I was just wondering, I mean, there's, there's not enough data, but it might, it might lend credence to the fact that the shadow cones are related to a point source somewhere. And they might scatter and vary, but, but there, could, there could be a statistical trend. Um, but that was anyway. Okay. Max, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Max is obviously working here, so you can ask him questions over coffee or tea. Uh, Max, thank you very much. Thank you. That was a great talk. One more round of applause. And then just to remind you of the upcoming Geo Talks, firstly and most importantly, we have a recess for two weeks for Human Rights Day next week and for a week of field research, so there won't be Geo Talks for the next two weeks. But you can see the rest of the talk schedule for the second quarter of the year on the screen. So we look forward to seeing you then.
Thanks very much.